What to do about problems is one of the continuing facts of human existence. Everybody here has had a problem, perhaps has one now, or will have one in the sweet by and by. So it behooves us to know what to do about problems. This being the case, a talk on the subject, how to handle your problem, seems to be entirely appropriate. Now I realize that the minute you mention the word problem, the general assumption is that you're going to deal with something which in its very nature is inherently bad and ought to be got rid of as fast as possible. But nothing could be further from the truth. A problem can be, and usually is, inherently good. When the good Lord wants to give you the greatest value in this life, how does he go about doing it? Does he wrap it up in a sophisticated package and hand it to you on a silver platter? Well, hardly. He is too subtle for that. The Lord's method is to take this great big value and insert it at the center of a big tough problem. And how he must watch with delight to see whether you've got what it takes to break that problem apart and find at its center, if you please, the pearl of great price. But even so, wherever I go, it seems that people do not like problems. Now, I don't like them myself. That's why I'm making this speech on the subject, <laughs> to talk myself into liking them. <laughs> but either by direct statement or by implication, People seem to say to me, wouldn't life be simply wonderful if either we had fewer problems or easier problems or better still, no problems whatsoever? Now, I should like to raise with you the philosophical and practical question, would you actually be better off if you had fewer problems or easier problems or no problems? whatsoever. Now, there's a question to roll around in consciousness. I think I should like to answer that question by telling you of an incident. I was walking down Fifth Avenue here in New York one day when I saw a friend of mine approaching me by the name of George. It was evident from George's melancholy and disconsolate demeanor that he wasn't what you might say filled to overflowing with the ecstasy and uh, happiness of human experience, which is a high class way of saying that George was dragon bottom. <laughs> he was really low. Well, this this uh, reached my human sympathy, so I said to him, how are you, George? <laughs> now, brothers and sisters, that was really a routine inquiry, but it represented an enormous mistake on my part. <laughs> for George took me seriously, and for 15 minutes he enlightened me meticulously on how badly he felt. And the more he talked, the worse I felt. <laughs> so finally I said, well, George, I'd like to help you if I can. Well, he said, why do you think I'm hanging around here wasting 15 minutes talking to you? <laughs> I said, what can I do for you? Why, he said, get me rid of these problems. Well, I said, I'd be glad to 
help you in any way I can, but let's get the matter straight. You would like to be rid of your most difficult problems, or perhaps you'd like to be rid of most of your problems. But I said, George, you're not going to stand here on the street this afternoon and tell me you want to be rid of all your problems. He said, the latter is the case. I have had it. And this conversation really set him off. Oh, he said, it's these problems. These problems are driving me mad. And he got so exercised about the matter that he quite forgot who he was talking to. And he began to castigate these problems vitriolically, <laughs> using what I'm sorry to say impressed me as a great many theological terms, <laughs> though he didn't put them together in a theological manner. But I knew what he meant all right, for he had what the super erudite call the power to communicate. I said, you want to get rid of all these problems, George? He said, every last one of them. And he said, if you'll get me rid of these problems, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make a contribution to your church of $2,500. Well, now I'm never one to turn a deaf ear to such an offer. <laughs> and I meditated, ruminated, and cogitated on the proposition. And I came up with an answer which I thought wasn't half bad. At least it was realistic, but apparently George didn't really go for it, for I have as yet to receive the aforementioned 2000 <laughs> He said, get me rid of these problems. I said, all right, George. I can tell you exactly how to do it. I said the other day, I was up in the northern part of New York City in the Bronx, on professional business, if I may thus characterize it. And I was in an area up there where the head man told me that by actual count there were 150,000 people and not a single one of them had a problem. The first enthusiasm I saw in George flashed up in his eyes and suffused his countenance as he said, boy, that's for me, lead me to this place. I said, okay, you asked for it. It's Woodlawn Cemetery in the <laughs> And this is a fact. Nobody in Woodlawn has a problem. They couldn't care less. What you and I will see on television tonight or reading tomorrow morning's newspapers, they have no problems at all, but they are dead. It follows, therefore, I believe in logical sequence that problems constitute a sign of life. Indeed, I would go so far as to say that the more problems you have, the more alive you are. The individual who has, let's say, only five tough, realistic problems is a uh, less alive than the person who has 10 problems. And if you have no problems at all, I warn you, <laughs> and what you better do the minute this meeting is over <laughs> is to go home and close your door and get down by the bed and pray to the Lord and say to the Lord, Lord, please, what's the matter? Don't you trust me anymore? Give me some problem. <laughs> now, I don't want to throw any sour note in the meeting, but I've got to tell you that you're going to have problems until the day you die. And heaven help you, some of you may have them after you die for all I know. <laughs> You see, when the good Lord in his wisdom made the world and when he made human beings, he wanted to make them strong. 
And you can't ever grow strong without resistance. You can't go strong in your body unless you bring it into resistance called exercise or struggle. You can't go strong in your mind unless you wrestle with tough situations. And you can't grow strong in your soul unless you have some great big old rugged problems to tussle with. That's the way he grows them strong. So the first principle in how to handle a problem is to have a philosophy of a problem. It's good. And every problem contains the seeds of its own solution. And if you're going to get solutions, you've got to have problems to get the solutions, solutions out of. So go out of this church this morning uh, when I finished. <laughs> having a greater respect for this phenomenon known as a problem. Haven't you seen the glorious faces of some old people, old men or old women? There was a famous Dutch painter made a reputation on painting old faces. What showed on those faces? Struggle, pain, suffering, hardship, and victory. That's what made them immortal in their physiognomy. Well, that's number one. And the second thing is a very simple one. Why more people don't learn it is hard to understand. The way to handle a problem when it comes along is to think about it, study it, pray about it, and then bring God into it as your partner. Let go and let God. Let him take it over. Don't worry about it. He loves you. He wants to do something for you. And he will always help you and guide you. It's just that simple. Now, a man that I admire is the famous baseball player, George Foster. He used to play with the Cincinnati Reds where he made a great reputation. And now he's with the New York Mets, I'm glad to say. Now, George was brought up by a Christian mother whom he calls by the old-fashioned term of mama. I always liked that mama thing. Something beautiful about it. Well, George had an idol. His idol was Willie Mays. He wanted to be a baseball player like the immortal Willie Mays. That was his goal, that was his dream, that meant everything to him. But in a scuffle one day, he turned a leg, injured the tibia, which leads into the kneecap. After much discussion and treatment, the doctors told him he'd be able to walk all right but never run. They all knew that he wanted to be a great big league baseball player, and they hated to tell him this. They were sad about it, but they said, George, you might as well accept it. You never can run, and therefore you never can be a great baseball player. So they put a cast on him all the way up to his hip, and he was sitting there dolefully, thinking about his wrecked future, 
when he said, Mama walked into the room. Now, Mama never even looked at this cast. And he said to her, Mama, they all tell me I never can run again. I never can be a baseball player. There is no way I can ever attain my dream or my goals. So Mama looked at him. And she says, son, you listen to me. You and I have a God that can make a way where there is no way. Now you are going to be what you dream. You're going to be one of the greatest baseball players. So George said, you know what I did? I just put one foot out into Mama's big old footsteps. <laughs> and I began to practice therapy. And I did everything to regain my old uh, agility. And I suppose that any athletic writer would admit that one of the greatest Baseball athletes of our time is a man named George Foster. He had a problem. He was through. But he put it in God's hands via Mama and overcame his problem. Now you may say, about your own problem. There is no way. I've had it. I can't ever do it. it, it no future, nothing, no, no possibility. Now don't ever talk like that. Because you have a God who makes a way where there is no way. Now there are a lot of people out here in this congregation, I can see them who've had experience along this line, who know that what I'm saying is the fact because they have themselves demonstrated it. For example, there's John Phillips sitting down there, my old friend. Been a member of this church for a long time. He's right here today. My wife and I and several of our friends here and a couple hundred other people were on a pilgrimage in the Holy Land recently. And part of us were on a ship in the Aegean and in the Mediterranean. And when I boarded this ship, the first man I saw was John Phillips. I thought I was back in Marble Church. And I said, what are you doing here, John? He said, going with you on this cruise. So we cruised all around and we finally came off roads the island of Rhodes. John said, I was born near here. I'm a Greek. Born in a little island just a few kilometers off of Rhodes. And standing there on the deck of the ship, we looked out over the blue waters of the sea. And he said, when I was about 14 or 15, I had one night a vision of Jesus. And Jesus told me that if I would follow him, he'd stick with me always. And he would guide me, take care of me, watch over me, and support me in every problem I would ever have. Then because the family was poor, it seemed best for me to go to America, land of dreams to which immigrants have come for generations, looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for a new life. So this little boy got himself a job on a ship washing dishes in first class. That's better than washing dishes in second class, I suppose. <laughs> He got to this country, he had nothing. Got down here at the battery. Think of a little Greek boy, 16 years old, no money in his pocket. 
walking up the streets of New York. That's the old romantic American story. After a while, he got very hungry, had nothing to eat. He went into a restaurant and he said to the proprietor, I must have a bowl of soup. And he said, sir, I'll work for you for a week if you'll give me a bowl of soup. And the man picked him up by the coat collar and took him to the door and kicked him into the street. Strange that there'd be such a human being. And then, utterly dejected, he walked along until he saw a big old New York policeman. And he said to the policeman, I'm hungry. I haven't had anything to eat for several days. And the policeman said, I'll take you, Sonny, to a place where you'll get some food. He took him to the Bowery Mission. And to this day, and I was eating in very good places with John, and he said, I've never had a meal that tasted as good as the soup and the big hard rolls they gave me in the Bowery Mission. So the little Greek boy went to work. He built up a substantial business, became a great, fine American and a wonderful Christian. And if I were to ask John to come up out of that pew and stand here this afternoon and tell you how he handled these problems, he would say it was God with him every step of the way. Now, this is a simple message. And you all are believers in God. Every person here believes that God is with him or her. So when a big old tough problem comes up, you just turn to God. Like I've got a letter here from a lady who lives in Ohio. And she says, I was an associate buyer for a flagging retail chain, which was sold by its parent company. I didn't know anything about this, but when I was on my way to New York for a buying trip, I was told that due to budget reasons, I was no longer an employee. That was my problem. Sixty other people were let go. I'm a practicing Christian, and I believe I handle the news very well. My husband and I are newlyweds, and we do need the two incomes. I didn't think I was qualified to enter any, any new field, but I happen to be a reader of guideposts and your books. And I read a couple of them on the way to my interview. I memorized that and I repeated those words when I was in an interview. And I began to pray, not for myself, but for the company that needed me and my skills. That felt silly, but you told me to do it. And I did it. And I also began to visualize myself in the right job. And I got the courage to call a district manager for a national chain of uh, women's clothing. I took a deep breath and began talking, feeling God with me every minute. The man said that he wanted me to talk to his area manager. And I had an interview with him and he offered me a job, and it's the best job I ever had in my life. And I walked out of there with tears in my eyes. I was so thrilled. And it seemed like Jesus took me by the hand. He did. 
He'll take you by the hand, no matter what. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great truth that in this life you give us problems in order to grow us strong, but that you bring into our weakness your strength, and so we have more strength than by human nature we possess, and we're able to handle our problems because you're with us always, even to the end of the world. Thank you so much. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.